I'm encouraged to see you this morning. And our study is in uh, 1 Peter. This is our last lesson in 1 Peter. And we're there looking at that uh, passage. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 14. We won't look in depth at all those verses. Uh, kind of as a theme here. And the theme is firm in your faith. If you will uh, look at 1 Peter 5 and let's read uh, verse or look at verse 9 again. Notice he says, resist him standing firm in the faith. Standing firm in the faith. And then skip down to verse 12. It says, well, he talks about Silas or Silvanus and he says that uh, I've written to you briefly encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. And then he says, stand fast in it. So stand firm in your faith. Firm in your faith that this is the grace of God. Firm in your faith as you resist the devil. Now in this context, there are at least five things, I think, that we see here that means how we can stand firm in our faith. And the big umbrella to this is bring yourself under the mighty hand of God. The first one to stand firm in the faith is found in verses 5 and 6. So back up to there. He says, In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Be clothed with humility, he says. Humble yourselves. Notice the in verse 5 there, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. To, to be a Christian, you have to be dressed for that. You have to have the right clothes. I'm not talking about the literal clothes that we wear. I'm talking about the spiritual clothes. And there are many passages in the New Testament that deal with that dress or that attire. Listen uh, to Colossians 3 verses uh, 12 and following. S this is from Paul. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on, that's like clothing, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. In addition to all these things, put on, just like putting on clothes, love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So wear these things like clothes, he says. Now back here in 1 Peter 5, we're told to be clothed with humility. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 4 of 1 Peter 5 when he's talking to elders, not just older men, but elders in the church. And then he now in verse 5, notice in the same way or likewise or in a similar way, you who are younger and you submit yourselves to the elders. In the same way as probably if you look at 5.1, to the elders I appeal. And so in the same way I appeal to you younger men. The, the term younger men would refer to all men in the church who are not elders. And then just as he's done several times in this, in this letter, he's given instructions to specific groups like slaves and others. And then he spreads it out in a general way. He does that. We're not going to go read it, but chapter 2, 13 through chapter 3 and verse 7. And then in 8, 3, 8 through 12, he gives instruction to everyone. And so here he says in verse 5, the latter part, all of you. So not just you, you younger men, but all of you. That would be everyone. Clothe yourself with humility. Now the word clothe here or put on is a rare word. It occurs only this one time in the New Testament. Some um, scholars want to uh, make this mean, and it might mean this, of the idea of tying on a, uh, a, a, an apron like a slave. Uh, 
whatever if it means that specifically we don't know but the point is that you need humility in all your relationships and you clothe yourselves with that you wear that when we see ourselves as we really are before God and, and we comprehend that then we should have humility when we measure and judge ourselves by the perfect standard of God that will automatically lead to, to humility when we measure and judge ourselves as we look around at others well oh, I'm better than that person they do this then that's not going to lead to humility humility is not self-hatred humility uh, doesn't involve denying the potential of good that we have humility is a true and honest view of who we are as we stand before God as we wrap this around us as we clothe ourselves in this that's essential to bring ourselves under the mighty hand of God if we're not humble we won't bring ourselves under the mighty hand of God and then he says because or for and in your Bibles I'm sure this is set apart as a quotation the latter part of verse 5 God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble that's a quotation from Proverbs 3 and verse 34 humility is a way of life it's to be a way of life in the world in which Peter lived humility was not something that was highly prized it was the lowly slave mentality now Peter says it it's not that see the, the society said you don't want to have that attitude that's not the attitude of a free citizen but Peter is already in this letter written to these uh, to these readers and he says you must regard yourselves as mainly citizens of God's kingdom in his society and so your whole values change you're here you're citizens in this world but but you're really just visiting strangers here and so you bring the mindset of where you're really a citizen of heaven and that's this humbleness this humility this lowliness you bring that into this world in which you live so you live by the standards of a different kingdom it's so verse 6 humble yourselves therefore under this mighty hand uh, of God this this phrase mighty hand of God occurs um, most often in the section of Scripture that refers to God delivering his people in the Exodus it's through his mighty hand that he did that and there are various passages in Exodus that show that and I'm not going to, to list those this is the only place in the New Testament where you have the phrase mighty hand of God you have hand of God working in Jesus but this is the only place where you have mighty hand of God uh, one person said this that the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's deliverance from the bondage of sin in this age into his eternal glory portrayed in biblical theology as a second exodus so God delivered his people from Egypt and now God delivers his people from bondage through his mighty hand and we have to bring ourselves under that mighty hand our willingness to submit to that is for a purpose look there at verse 6 the latter part that here's the purpose that he may lift you up in due time. Notice we don't lift ourselves up. He will lift us up in due time. And so to be firm in our faith, Peter says, we have to be clothed with humility. That's the first thing. Then look at verse 7. This is the second thing from this text, or second command, to be firm in our faith. And that is we cast all our care, our anxiety, upon him let's read verse 7 cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you I mean I don't have to tell you that life here on earth will always have a variety of concerns and cares and anxiety each day probably brings new ones in, in our lives there are troubling distractions there are fears there is is pain we can't escape the sickness the emotional distress the the disappointments of, of living here in this world and I mean for the original readers of this they were 
facing daily persecution. And he says, you turn that over to God. You cast all your cares, your anxiety to him. See, remember he said that at the proper time, God will lift you up. That's still future. That's a promise. We can depend on that. But that's still future. Well, what about now? How do we live now? God doesn't leave us unsupported as we live humble lives of humility in, in the world. Uh, he's, basically, the idea is this. You, you be humbled and cast your care upon Him. The two ideas go together. You clothe yourself with humility and cast all your anxiety upon Him. Now, why, notice the reason. Because He cares for you. By trusting His Word, praying, letting our perspective, our attitude be changed and determined by His will, we cast our care upon Him. God takes that. God provides. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 11, If you then, being evil, He's talking to fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? Cast your care, your anxiety upon Him. That's another way of saying what Peter has said before back in uh, chapter 4, 19. Entrust yourselves to a faithful Creator. Jesus taught anxiety about this life can choke out the Word. God's Word to be fruitful in our lives there has to be this idea that we trust God, that we cast our anxiety, our fears uh, upon Him. Uh, this worry, this anxiety, this fear is striving to secure our own life. And He says, you lift that up and you give that to God. God knows. He's not unaware. He, he knows. And God is concerned, very concerned, about what each of you go through in day-by-day -day life. And Peter says, you cast that care upon Him. You don't bear that yourself. And so when I clothe myself in humility, when I cast my anxiety upon God, I'm placing myself under His mighty hand. The third thing that we see of how to stand firm in our faith is in verses 7 and 8. And we are to be sober and vigilant. Look at verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. And then be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. This is the only reference in 1 Peter that talks about spiritual powers of darkness and he names the spiritual power of darkness here as the devil as Satan the opponent of God and this verse is teaching that we have to have constant attention constant vigilance because of such a powerful enemy he uh, he has uh, energy he is steadfast in his job to seek to bring us down and so we need to be spiritually sober and, and alert. That, that, what that means is to be mentally focused, to, stick, to think straight, to keep our mind focused on God and, and on living in, in this world, to be watchful. I mean, if you're not watchful, we just walk right into temptations. And the devil is there like a, like a lion. We slip into the devil's hands. If we're not alert, if we're not sober, if we're not vigilant. Now, by being sober and vigilant, we bring ourselves under God's mighty hand. You think of this. If you have a group of sheep and then you have a lion, the, the roar of the lion is going to scatter the, the flock of, of sheep in panic. It's also going to threaten the shepherd. Now you remember at the beginning of this chapter, chapter, he says that elders are to shepherd the flock. And so you have a flock, you have shepherds, and then you have a lion who's roaring around. When a lion is on the prowl, then neither the shepherd nor the sheep can sleep. They have to be alert. They have to be awake. 
They have to be watchful. And the goal of the devil here, he says, that he's looking to devour you. That's the, the, he's to annihilate you, to do away with the Christian and the church collectively. And so we're to be sober and vigilant, and we do that by placing ourselves under the mighty hand of God. The next way that we stand firm in our faith from this text is verse 9. We've already been introduced to the devil, to this lion, and we are to resist him. So we're to be sober and awake, but also we are to resist him. Look at verse 9 again. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. By the wise use of defensive tactics, by also offense against this enemy, against this lion, by preaching, by, by practicing, by prayer, by putting all these things in, into practice in our life, by using the mighty weapons of God, by wearing the armor, we resist the devil. And then he says that he will flee. You resist him. James tells us he will, he will flee. And so we can be strong and effective. We have to be sober and awake. But we resist him. You stand against him. Then the last way that we stand firm in our faith in this text is in verses 10 through 12 in that we stand in the grace of God. So that, that kind of ties all this up because we might think, okay, well, I resist him and I resist him with my strength. But the problem is I don't have enough strength to res resist such a powerful enemy. The strength that I have comes from the grace of God. So we're to stand firm in the grace of God. Notice... Uh, well, let's read this, uh, 10 through 12. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, we have verses 12 through 14, and we'll talk about those in just a second. We're not going to say a lot about those. But notice the letter in, those are like uh, you know, closing remarks about this person, this person, so on. But notice the letter ends, verse 11, and his exhortation is to him, that's the one who can make you strong, be power forever and ever. And he's described as a, the God of all grace in verse 10. The, the strength to live firm in our faith comes from the God of all grace. And what we're called to do is to learn, to rely, to be dependent on God's grace. We're to hold, at, when we learn God's grace, when we stand in that grace, then we're to hold our ground and to persevere. And we're looking for the time when Christ returns. Notice you suffered a little while then he'll restore you. That's looking to the future. There's suffering, and Peter's very plain in this letter that you'll go through suffering, but he also affirms it's just a little while. It's just, and I think the idea is it's a little while in contrast to eternity. And he uses four terms here that probably mean about the same thing to describe what God will do in uh, verse 10. Notice he will, uh, in your translations may have this put a different way, he will uh, put things right, he'll strengthen you, he'll empower you, and he will secure you. In a society where Christians are suffering, things are not right. But God will give you the strength. And one day, he will put things right. As you humble yourselves under his mighty hand, then you can depend that he will, will put these things right. The resources for living today are found in the knowledge of, of the future, of what God will do. This is certain, Peter says. He didn't say he might do these things. He will do these things. 
You stand firm. Your, your lives now partake of that future glory. And how you feel about the future shapes how you live now. Now, as I mentioned, Peter's final word is a word of praise there in verse 11. His final word before he gets to the, just the closings to mention. But notice verse 11. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. When Peter wrote this to all human appearance, it was the power was to Rome. But Peter says the power is not to Rome. It's not to government. It's not to any government. The power is to God. He has the power forever and ever. In fact, God's power makes Rome power or any other government's power look like a wilted flower. God has this power. Now, it's interesting. That word for dominion or power there in verse 11 is used as an adjective back in verse 6 to describe God's hand. It's mighty. So he has dominion or power, and that describes his hand. That mighty hand. He has might, and that might describes his hand. And he displays that power in the world. He displays that power in his, in his people. Now, we'll just read, uh, if you have your Bibles open, I want to read the rest of uh, the chapter, verses 12 through 14, and I'm not going to say much about those verses. I'll say a few things, but the main thing I want us to get are these things that we need to do to remain firm in the faith. But beginning with verse 12, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. And so does my son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Well, who, uh, who is Silas or Silvanus and what part did he play in this letter? Who is the one, she who is in Babylon, who's sending these greetings? And, who, and does Peter really have a physical son named Mark? And is Mark sending these greetings? Well, uh, briefly, a lot of people understand Silvanus as Silas from the book of Acts and that he is the one who uh, was like the scribe in writing this letter closely associated with Peter. And that may be true. Peter says he's a faithful brother. <clears throat> then in verse 13, the one, she who is in Babylon. What's, what's Babylon? Uh, some commenta older commentators understand as literal Babylon. Some, one, uh, at least one person I found said that this is actually Peter's wife. She who's in Babylon. She sends the greeting. Uh, not a lot of people buy that. Most people think that this is talking about the church in Rome sends greetings to these Christians. Uh, also, Mark is um, thought to be John Mark from the book of Acts and that he is Peter's son and that he's his spiritual son. He sends greetings. Well, however we might solve all of those different mysteries, the, the main point, the major point in his closing is, is clear. This is the grace of God. He's talking about the whole letter. This is the grace of God Stand firm in it. Stand in God's grace. How do we stand in God's grace? How do we stand firm in our faith? We br bring ourselves under God's mighty hand, and we do that by being clothed with humility, by casting all our care and anxiety on Him, by being sober and, and vigilant, because we have an enemy, the devil, and we must resist him. And so Peter says, that's, that's how you do it. Now, if we study these concepts, we put these into practice in our lives, we examine ourselves, there is a promise. And that is God says he will exalt us at the proper time. Jim has announced an invitation song, 655. There's a fountain free. So we sing this song. It's a call, if you're not a Christian, to come to this tremendous grace in what God has done in His Son, Christ, who...
who God so loved the world, he gave his son. Christ died for our sins. And in the New Testament, when people hear this message about Christ dying for their sins, they say, what should I do? And the answer is given, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. When we continue to hear that message of what God has done in Messiah, in Christ, then what are we to do? We're to stand firm in our faith. We're to cast ourselves upon Him. We're to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. And it might be this morning that you are living your life and not bringing yourself under God's hand, and then this is an invitation for you. It's our prayer that if you need to come, you'll do that as we stand and sing.